morning, everyone. We're going to be looking at John 14 this morning. Uh, for some of us, uh, well-known verses, perhaps uh, verses that are very precious to us. John 14, 1 to 4. Jesus says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. These precious words, let not your hearts be troubled. I have to admit that in my life, these words have not always brought comfort. I've had times in my life where my heart was extremely troubled. Those nights where you lay awake and you toss and turn and you're worried. And I would, I would re re recite this verse in my mind. I would go over it again and again. This was actually a passage that my parents uh, had me memorize when I was quite young. I knew these verses. So I would meditate on them. I would mull them over in my mind over and over, and I would wonder, why did I still feel so troubled? And I wonder if that's ever been true for you. Here's the first thing I want us to see when we hear Jesus say these words, let not your hearts be troubled. What he's revealing to us in these words is actually a great comfort because it shows us that there is a choice involved in this issue of a troubled heart. That's encouraging because I know in my life I have assumed at times that I was out of control, that I had no means by which I could deal with the anxieties in my heart, with my fears, with my concerns about the circumstances in my life. But Jesus is signaling to us here that that's not true, that we actually do have some choice in what's going on in our hearts. Before we talk about that, let's just consider for a moment, why did Jesus say this in the first place? He was speaking to his disciples. Uh, Judas had left the room, so there were 11 men in the room with Jesus, and they indeed were troubled. There's a number of reasons for this. If you go back to John chapter 11, you'll find that the disciples were well aware that in Jerusalem there was a plot to kill Jesus. The Jewish leaders there, the Pharisees, uh, and, and it was widely known, were, were out to get him. They wanted to kill Jesus, and the disciples knew this. This was the Last Supper. This was a meal that was taking place in Jerusalem. They'd gone back to the very place where Jesus' life was in danger. Then, if you go back to chapter 13, you find Jesus, as he'd done so many times, reminding them that he would be leaving them. He had told them and taught them many times that he was going to be killed. The very thing that they knew was being plotted against him, he said, it's going to happen. And in chapter 13, he's telling them, I'm going to leave. And then in that chapter, as we see in all the gospels, he reveals to them that he was about to be betrayed by one of his own, one of them was going to betray him. And they began to look around and wonder, who is it? And then even Peter, at the end of chapter 13, promises to Jesus that he is ready to die for him. And yet to Jesus, or excuse me, yet to Peter, Jesus declares that he actually is soon to deny. So all of these things were swirling around in that room and swirling around in the hearts of these disciples of Jesus. And Jesus knew them well. He knew that they were deeply troubled in their hearts. And so he says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Tammy shared this with us in her testimony that the word of God is not something that we merely use as a kind of mantra to try and psych ourselves up to feel better. And I confess that there have been times in my life where I've tried to use God's word that way, where I've tried to recite it, or I've tried to read it, or I've tried to have it playing in my car or in my house, thinking that just the, merely the sound of it would help me overcome my anxieties. And granted, many of us have had the experience where we, 
We hear the sound of God's word and it does encourage us. It's powerful, it's living. It penetrates to the division of soul and spirit, Hebrews chapter four says. And yet we have to realize that the power of God's word comes primarily when we choose to believe it and to obey it. Now I know in my life, I actually need God's help even for those things. I need God's help when it comes to really believing what his, what his word says. And then when it comes to obeying it, I certainly need God's help. So this is not something we muster up in ourselves. And yet the power of God's word is so often unlocked when we choose to obey, when we become the doer of it and not just the hearer of it. And so I have to reckon with this reality. When Jesus says, don't do that, He's revealing to me that there is a choice involved. Now, the good news, if you're like me and you say, well, how do I possibly, how, how can I just possibly make that choice? How do I overcome my anxieties and my troubles and my worries? Well, the good news is these four verses are gonna give us the answer to this. This is gonna be one of those times where Jesus says, not this, but this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't think this, don't feel this, don't believe this. Believe this. So what does he go on to say? Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. We're gonna see in these verses two things, two uh, resources that Jesus gives us to overcome our troubled hearts. What does it require? First of all, that we choose to obey, that we choose to deny ourselves the right to allow ourselves to be troubled. We choose to not do that. And instead, we choose something else. So here's the first one. Jesus says, in order to overcome your troubled hearts, you need to do this. You need to choose to trust. In my version, maybe in your version as well, verse 1 goes on to speak of belief, believing in God, believing in Christ. The idea here, as it is all through Scripture, when we talk about or read about faith or believing the idea behind this word is trust. We sometimes use the word believe to describe something that we think is true, but biblical belief and faith is very different than that. It's actually this idea of trusting. I can stand and look at a bridge and say, well, I believe that that bridge would hold me, but that's not trust. It's not trust, it's not true faith, it's not biblical faith until I go and stand on the bridge. So what is Jesus saying to those of us who are troubled, to his disciples who are troubled? You need to choose to not be troubled, and instead you need to choose to trust. What do I trust? He says, you believe in God. Now, uh, from what I understand, these phrases can be translated uh, as a description. You do believe in God, you do believe in me, or they can be translated and understood as an imperative command. Uh, another way of understanding it might be this way, keep trusting in God, keep trusting in me, acknowledging that that's something that the disciples have been doing, but they have to keep doing it. Trust in God. That's the first one, trust in God. So when we find ourselves like these disciples in a time when we feel troubled and concerned and worried, when life seems against us, Jesus says, choose to not let your hearts be troubled. Instead, choose to trust in God. Look at this verse here, Psalm 91. As I begin to learn in my own life, in my own experience, that there really was an answer, a biblical answer to how we deal with the struggles of life, this is one of the ways that I learned to trust in God. Psalm 91 verses one and two says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the most high will rest in the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. This is exactly what the songwriter is doing here as he writes these verses. He is making the choice. He's declaring, this is what I'm going to do. This is whom I will trust. So I began to learn to do this in my own life. And I, used, I, I began to take some of these images that scripture gives us 
and so many of them are in the Psalms, images of who God is and what he's like. So here we have the idea of resting in the shadow of the Almighty. If we were to read on, we would read of God being like a mother bird who, who shelters her chicks with her wings. Or in the second verse where we read of God being a refuge, a fortress. I love that one. So here's what I used to do as I began to learn what it meant to choose to trust God in the midst of my anxieties. I would begin to picture these images. These are biblical images. God is the one who gave me an imagination. God is the one who's given me these metaphors and these images. So I used to put those two things together, and I still do. And I would begin to meditate on God being like a fortress. So I would picture... I would picture a stone castle, a stone fortress. I would picture myself being on the inside of that fortress and faintly, very faintly, uh, I could hear wind and rain and storm battering the outside of that fortress, but I pictured myself safely within that fortress because that's exactly the picture God is giving us of himself. That when we are the people of God, we can trust him because he is our fortress. The New Testament tells us that we are actually in God and in Christ and he is in us. And we have that level of security. So I began to do this. And as I chose not to be afraid and chose to trust God and instead of laying awake and fretting over all the problems in my life, I began to meditate on this picture and imagine and visualize this was true for me. And amazingly, I began to sleep at night simply through meditating on what God says he is like. Choose to trust God. This is the relationship that God wants to have with us. He wants us to know that he is trustworthy. We need to know that. But then he wants us to choose to trust him. Every relationship, every healthy relationship is built on trust. That's why when two people get together in marriage, they make vows to each other. They make promises to each other. Promises that are meant to solidify trust in one another. And that's why when, uh, when a spouse violates those promises, there's so much work to do to rebuild that trust. Relationships are built on trust. The more deep the trust goes, the more deep and meaningful the relationship. If trust is shallow, the relationship is shallow. God wants a relationship with his people. And isn't it wonderful that he says, here's what you need to do. You need to believe in me. You need to trust me. And the more deeply we trust God, the more we experience the beauty, the reality of a relationship with him. So Jesus says to the, these troubled disciples, you've been trusting God, you've been learning to trust God, you're Jewish men, you know the Old Testament stories, you've seen what God can do. Trust God, choose to trust God. But then Jesus takes it a step further and says something that's astonishing that should solidify our understanding of his divine nature. Imagine a man in this room with these 11 Jewish men saying, just like you trust God, you should trust me. Now that is the height of blasphemy in the context of Jewish culture and understanding, unless you're actually divine, unless you're actually a God man which is what we know Jesus to be. This is who he was. So he could place himself right alongside God. And he could tell his disciples, just as you trust in God, you need to trust in me. Now, why is this precious? Number one, as I've just said, it's because it reminds us that Jesus is God, that he is the son of God, that he is divine. And all the things that we know about Jesus and what he's done for us come out of this reality that he is actually God. So the fact that God would even come to earth and become a human being is astonishing and amazing and incredible. And no wonder we sing about his amazing grace. The fact that this man would come to earth 
not just to teach us about God, not just to show us what God is like, but to literally become the one who would suffer so that we could find salvation from our sins. It's amazing. And here's where comfort comes for us. When Jesus says, trust me, what he's reminding us is that God is not some distant being who does not know what it's like to suffer, who, who's never experienced what we experience in this life. When Jesus is saying, you trust God, trust me. He's asking us to trust in himself, one who had also suffered. What's interesting is if you go back and look at chapter 13, look at verse 21, and he's beginning to share with his disciples in these verses about one of them betraying him. And in verse 21, it says, Jesus was troubled in spirit. It's the same word that we find in chapter 14, verse 1. In other words, Jesus telling his disciples not to be troubled, just verses after John tells us that Jesus himself was troubled. Now we can say, well, he had good reason to be troubled. He was sharing about one of his own disciples betraying him. Far more than that, he was about to experience the weight of all of the fears and all of the sin and all of the rebellion of all humanity. He was about to carry the weight of that on the cross. So here's the beauty of it. Jesus can say to us, if we're his followers, you don't need to be troubled. You choose not to be troubled. Why? Because Jesus took all of our troubles on himself. Isn't that what it says in Isaiah 53? He was a man of suffering, familiar with pain. He was despised. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Why did Jesus have to become a man? Why did he have to suffer everything in life that we suffer? Why did he have to go through that? Well, it's because that's what the gospel is. The good news that we can be rescued from uh, our own sinfulness and rescued from this broken world because God came into this world and became troubled. He became sin. He took our place and our punishment. That is the good news of salvation. So Jesus can say to these men, trust God. He is your fortress. Choose to believe that. Choose to trust in that. And then choose to trust me. At this moment, they wouldn't understand all that that meant or why or how they could trust him. But very soon they would come to see that Jesus, in fact, was the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. That he was the one to take our place in suffering and in trouble. So here's the first thing. Choose to not be troubled. Instead, choose to trust God. Choose to trust Jesus. Choose to trust. But then there's a second thing we see in these verses, and it's this. Be assured. I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? But when, whenever we're troubled about anything, if we're troubled about finances, if we're troubled about our health, if we're troubled about a family member, those of us who have teenagers and and, and they're out late in the evening and, and doing whatever they're doing and they're, and they're driving and, and we're listening. We're listening for the sound of that vehicle coming home. And assurance is the answer to that concern. The assurance that our child is okay. They've come home safely. They stayed out of trouble. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, okay, you need to choose to not be troubled and let me give you some assurance to help you with that. First, we saw that we need to choose to trust him. Now, we need to choose to be assured or we need to believe what Jesus says to us as to why we can be assured. So what does he say? Verse 2. My father's house has many rooms. My father's house has many rooms. Here's the first point of assurance. Here's Jesus with his disciples. 
And he's telling them that he has to leave. And they know they're living in a world that's against Jesus and it's gonna be against them. Uh, mere weeks from this time or months, one of them is gonna be martyred. James would become the first martyr. He's sitting here at this table. But here's some assurance for you. My father's house has many rooms. And then Jesus, of course, is gonna talk about how there is a place for them, obviously insinuating that that he's going to prepare a place for them in the Father's house. I just love this. I mean, don't you love going, don't you love when you can go home? This is one of the challenges of, of, of lockdown. Some of us haven't seen our parents for a while or we haven't been able to sit around the dinner table with brothers and sisters and nieces and nephews and, or grandchildren. There is a house, the Father's house, God's house, and the whole story of the Bible is God is going to get his children back. He created humanity to be his people, his children, his family. And humanity stepped out from under his roof and said, we don't want to live. We don't want to live under your roof. We don't want to live by your rules. We don't want to have you as our father, as our king. Humanity steps out from that safe place of God's house. And ever since, God has said, I'm going to get you back. Not in retribution. I mean, he, he wants his family back. He wants his children back. And through Jesus and through the gospel, now there is a way for us to be reunited with God. And here's the assurance for these 11 men. Jesus is saying, you are the father's children. And, and he has a place for you in his house. There is a guest room for you. Many of us learn these verses in the old King James. And I think the old King James says that there's many mansions. And that's actually uh, caused many of us to think of this in, in a very physical, very materialistic way. Who knows what it's going to be like? In fact, let me show you uh, one, of the way, one of the ways that we can try to understand what Jesus is talking about. This comes from Revelation 21. It's a description of the heavenly city a dwelling where God is going to dwell with his people. In Revelation 21, we read of this city coming down out of heaven to the new earth. And this is what it says. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length. And notice this, as wide and as high as it is long. The city is square. No, it's not square. It's cube. 12,000 stadia is 2,200 kilometers. So this is a cube that's 2,200 kilometers long and 2,200 kilometers wide and 2,200 kilometers high. Mount Everest is less than nine kilometers above sea level. The city of God, our future dwelling place, God's house is a city with over 10,000 cubic kilometer. T sorry, 10,000. Let me get that right. 10 billion cubic kilometers. This is like so much of what we find in biblical prophecy when we get descriptions of what's to come and what the future holds. We have certainty and we have mystery. So here's the description. We know there's a city that's coming. It's a promise of God. We can be absolutely certain about that. Can I be certain to understand what is it going to be like to live in this city that's 22 kilometer, 2,200 kilometers high? I have no idea what that's going to be like. To me, this reminds us of Jesus once he uh, got his resurrected body and he could just go through walls. It seems that in the new heaven and the new earth... We are not going to be bound to the earth by gravity like we are now. And we're going to live in a place where it's almost like there's another dimension where we don't just walk on flat ground. We, we live in space in every dimension, in every direction. Maybe it's a little bit like a, a, a cruise ship where I've never been on a cruise ship. I'm not sure I'd want to be right now, but on a cruise ship where there's all these levels and, you know, there's a swimming pool on this floor and you can go up to the next floor and there's this viewing balcony. You can see the ocean. You can go up. There's a water slide up on the top. 
This is the house of God. Over 10 billion cubic kilometers. That means that if God decided that your room or everyone's room was a cubic kilometer in the heavenly city, the, the new city of God, there would be space for over 10 billion people of God to have their own cubic kilometer. So this is a grand understatement when Jesus says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. We have no idea what this is gonna be like. It sounds amazing. I can't wait to be there. Of course, the greatest element of the heavenly city is not whatever space I get or whatever, whatever crown I get. It's that Jesus will be there that God will be there, that they, we will see the Father, we will see the Son. There's no light there because the Son of God is the light of the city. Be assured. Whatever it is that we're going through, whatever our suffering today, whatever our anxiety, Jesus wants to be assured. Believe this. Know this. That you belong to the Father. You are his child. And he has a room. It's not a guest room. Because you're not a guest in the Father's house. It's your room. You belong to the Father. You are his. So be assured. Jesus goes on to say, My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? Here's the second thing that brings us assurance as followers of Jesus. Inside information. Notice here, Jesus is talking about what he's already told them. I, I, would, I, would I not, would I, would I have told you? It's translated in different ways and different versions, but the idea here is what Jesus is saying is, I've given you the inside information. Look down at verse 29 of chapter 14. I have told you now before it happens, so that it, when it does happen, you will believe. See what Jesus is saying here. I've told you, I've told you things that you need to know. We saw it last week in chapter 15. Look again in chapter 15. Verse 15 of chapter 15, he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Everything we need to know, Jesus has made known. Look at chapter 16, verse 1. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. Be assured, I have told you what you need to know, which by the way is why he could say in uh, verse four of chapter 14, you know the way to the place where I am going. He has given us everything that we need to know. We have the inside information. We simply need to choose to believe that it is true. Everything we need to know has been made known to us. Now, if you're like me, you might be thinking, well, there's all kinds of things I'd like to know that I don't know. I would argue that on this topic of the end times, as I've said already, there's certainty and there's mystery. There's things that are absolutely crystal clear and that's because Jesus meant them to be absolutely crystal clear. And then there's other things that are, are mystery to us. We don't fully comprehend them. How could there be a city 2,200 kilometers in height? Doesn't compute. We don't understand. We won't until we get there. But everything we need to know, Jesus has made known to us, including the way to the Father's house. Jesus will later say in verse 6, he himself is the way. The primary knowledge is not information. The primary knowledge is a relationship with Jesus, knowing him. That's what really matters. Sometimes we get into trouble when we want to understand and explain everything theologically, or we want to be able to, to give all the specifics of what's going to happen in the future. That's not the point. Jesus is saying, you need to know me. And to those of us who do know him, he, he would say that, you, you know me, you have seen the Father through me, he'll go on to say, 
And in me and through me, you know the way, you know the truth, and you have the life. All because we know Jesus. We have the inside track. We have the inside information. And then one last thing. Be assured of this. There is a reunion coming. Verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. What a promise. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You sense the, the joy, the, the anticipation from Jesus. I mean, surely we should be filled with anticipation, but you get the sense that he is, that he's looking forward to the time when he's reunited with his disciples and with all of us who are his children. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17 speaks of that time when uh, those who are alive in Christ will be caught up, those who are dead in Christ will be resurrected, and then these precious words, so we will be with the Lord forever. Be assured of this. Be assured there is a reunion coming. Scripture speaks of how that reunion, the glory of that time when we are with Jesus, cannot compare to the suffering we experience now, it will seem like nothing compared to the glory that we will have when we see Jesus. Choose to not be troubled by choosing to trust in God and by being assured of the promises that he has made. As we close, I want us to take a few moments to consider why are these kinds of promises in the Bible? There's not a lot of detail here. This is, this is a promise about the return of Jesus and his gathering his disciples to be with him forever. Not a lot of detail here given. But why do we have these promises? And why do we have other places in Scripture that talk about what's going to happen and what it will be like and various events? As I've said already, the point isn't that we can educate ourselves and figure out all the details, the point is that we would be assured. Scripture actually gives us various reasons why we need to know about the future. So as we head into our series next week called Living Hope, I want to just share four things with you. What is the purpose of Bible prophecy? What is the purpose of these promises in Scripture about the future? Four things. Number one, vigilance. Mark 13, 23, be on your guard. I've told you everything ahead of time. Jesus taught over and over that we should be watchful, pay attention, live in light of his soon return. Matthew 24, 42, keep watch. You do not know on what day your Lord will come. He wants us to live with a vigilance about life. Scripture says that we should number our days so that we could gain a heart of wisdom. So we live with vigilance, aware that this is a temporal uh, life that we're living now, that there is an eternity to come, and so much hangs on that future. Number two, purpose of Bible prophecy is that we would be diligent. So first of all, vigilance, then diligence. First Peter 3, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God. And 1 John 2, 28, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed. We have end times teaching in the Bible to give us fuel for diligence, vigilance, but also diligence. When we know that Jesus is coming back, when we know that uh, there's a moment coming when we will stand before him, it should fuel us to live holy and godly lives to live in light of his coming. Number three, purpose of Bible prophecy. Vigilance, um, diligence, and then this one, endurance. Matthew 24, 13, the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. In Romans 14, 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. You always remember that the New Testament was written to people, real people, going through real circumstances. In fact, the believers 
in the time when the New Testament was written were so often facing suffering and persecution and often martyrdom. So these things were written to them to help them endure. Finally, reassurance. First Thessalonians 4 says, We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Vigilance, diligence, endurance, and reassurance. This is why we have biblical teaching on the end times. May God help us to be encouraged to follow Jesus. And whatever we're going through today, be encouraged. Keep following Jesus. Don't give up. You're troubled. You're going through hard things today. Jesus is beckoning us. Keep following me. Be faithful. A time is coming when we will be reunited. Let's sing about that as we close. Just want to invite you again to uh, join us on Zoom for about half an hour if you'd like to uh, say hello to anyone or just have a chance to discuss what we've been learning this morning. Have you trusted in Christ? Not asking if you believe mentally that he's real or that he died for you, but have you trusted your life to him, the one who came to this earth to take on our trouble and our sin and our, our penalty? Uh, he offers himself to you. And by trusting in him, we have this tremendous assurance that we belong to God, that there is a place reserved for us, that we are at home with him. Uh, so I just trust that if you've never come to that place of, of receiving Christ, that you might do it today. And if you have, I trust that uh, the words we've read and studied today would be a great encouragement to you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for who you are a God who is fully trustworthy. We thank you so much for sending your son, uh, God himself in this world, walking this planet in order to be our savior. Thank you so much, Jesus, for what you've done for us. I pray that uh, you would uh, bring us to that place of trust and faith. If someone listening today has never trusted you for salvation, I pray that you'd bring them all the way into your family today. Help them to understand, help them to choose and Lord, those of us who are your children, help us to understand what it means to make this choice not to be troubled, to make this choice to, to trust you and to be assured by the things that you've said. We thank you for the hope, the future that we have. Uh, we look forward to it. Uh, we we want to live in light of it now, Lord. So be with us in the week ahead. May we shine brightly for you in Jesus' name. Amen.